I said I was never going to do a PowerPoint in this class. We're going to go all old school, no new, no PowerPoint stuff, all traditional discussion type activities. But I had worked up some stuff, some imagery from uh, for this class. And so I was going back and forth with the PowerPoint idea anyway, because I want to show you some maps and some pictures and stuff like that. And it's just hard to do without projection. But I was resisting until today and this morning, I saw this Jonathan Marks post on Facebook. And my the, the stuff I was working up was precisely about the Neanderthals, the emergence of modern humans and the Denisovan admixture stuff. And when I saw this Facebook post, I simply couldn't resist it. Now, Jonathan Marks is a, is a famous biological anthropologist. Um, he is so famous that he appears on the back of your, of, uh, of your book. He has a blurb there, which means, you know, he's, he's a big enough name that if he writes something, it might sell more books. In this insightful collection, Sang He Lee shows herself to be a gifted storyteller, breathing new life into the old bones with both the intimate knowledge of a practitioner and a dose of cross-cultural scientific sensitivity. A pleasure to read. I totally agree with great stuff, right? And I love that she has a, a, a unique, maybe perhaps not unique, but an interesting perspective that draws from across human cultures on some of these issues. Completely agree with Jonathan Marks on this. He's one of my favorite biological anthropologists. Most academics who choose a social media place to be I think usually choose Twitter. It's a little more professional, a little faster. You get, you get in with the journalists and the politicians that way. And I far prefer Twitter to Facebook because on Facebook, who do you find? <laughs> I don't know, are you on Facebook? Has anybody on Facebook? No, you're not on Facebook. So you don't find the thinking people. You find your parents. That's who you find. You find people that you already know, your friends. So most academics, I certainly don't want to post on Facebook anything like this, but Jonathan Marks is not afraid to mix it up a little bit. Start a Facebook debate. And this was a while ago that he had 50 comments going on this thing. He's probably up to more now. So there we go. Of all the fucking stupid things paleoanthropologists have done over the last century or so, racializing Pleistocene hominins into European, Neanderthal, African, modern, and Asian Denisovan is probably the fucking stupidest. Now, we have to figure out what he is talking about. I'm not completely sure I know what he's talking about. I know what I think. I want to talk about how stupid this is or how anthropology went in this direction, I think he might simply be talking about the racializing itself, the, the idea that these come as sort of racial units. But uh, I have my own take on this, which I've been thinking about for the past 10 years, and here we are. I am not a paleoanthropologist. Oh, he's got all these likes though. See, he did so well. He got the likes, he got, you know, he got likes and, uh, and this, oh, you're not on Facebook. This means ha ha, I guess you can tell that. But if I had to choose an emoji for this, it'd be angry because it's making me mad that we went in this direction. And I think it has some serious consequences, which is why we had to go with PowerPoint for this. So let's start though, with finding out what are, when, do you have a stereotype of Neanderthals or, we could have a whole class on why it is spelled in different ways, but uh, there's these, these were the creatures that were found in the Neander Valley in Germany. And the word for valley in 
is, is in German, I believe, is uh, spelled in Old German, or the old translation into English was T-H-A-L, and so that was the original, but then in sort of updated German, it becomes T-A-L. I don't know if that changes the pronunciation at all, so if you're a cool person, you leave out that H, but we're not going to worry about that. Anyway, if I say this word to you, Neanderthals, what stereotypes come to your mind? Big head, protruding brow line. Okay. All right. Liz, what do you got? That they're not smart. Yeah, okay. They're not smart. Yeah. Well, uh, short, stocky, and brutish. All right. Well, okay. I guess then your, your stereotypes do align with what I think most paleoanthropologists became convinced that there was a huge negative stereotype against Neanderthals. And as Lee puts it on page 179, she starts off this chapter with the idea that you are a ne you're such a Neanderthal is an insult. Do people insult each other with this word anymore? No, I don't know. I feel like that's how to say. I'm not, I guess I would say right off the bat that I'm not completely convinced there is such a huge brutish stereotype. Although since it seems to exist with you, I might revise that. There was, uh, as Lee puts it on page 181, she's basically saying what this author said that the stereotype of Neanderthals as savages was the fault of this French scientist who found one that was not in the best condition. And then all these imagery comes up. And as the subtitle says, why Neanderthals became a savage other in our narrative of human evolution, which is pretty bad. I mean, I have to say, if that is true, if they are stereotyped as the savage other for human evolution, then, you know, that's kind of, uh, that's something we might want to fight against. And a lot of the paleoanthropologists found it good or found a calling, you might say, in fighting these stereotypes of the, uh, the brutish, the, the evil, the bad, uh, the savage, the other, because that seemed like it was, you know, the cultural anthropologists were trying to fight these stereotypes about savage people. So it was the, the equivalent perhaps in paleoanthropology to fight against these stereotypes about Neanderthals and the insults and the racist depictions of them. To the extent that another famous paleoanthropologist famous a lot because he was, uh, is, was, he, he's definitely on Twitter, one of the biggest bloggers in paleoanthropology, John Hawks, who gets a couple of mentions in, um, in Lee's book. They both actually shared, I'm not sure, at, not at the same time, but they shared a, an advisor at the University of Michigan, uh, Mil Professor Milford Wolpoff. Anyway, Hawks, on his blog used to collect these things that he, or collect these statements and he cataloged them as the Neanderthal anti-defamation files. And so he would collect these stereotypical representations in the popular culture, you know, like, you know, that, that Neanderthals couldn't talk so they couldn't have rap. And then, you know, he said, haters will be hate. So the idea was you would be able to, you would be fighting against these 
stereotypes about the Neanderthals. One of the ways in which people fought against that stereotype was by talking about the big heads and their big brains, that the cranium size of the Neanderthals was actually larger than that of us modern humans. And as this article states, uh, in any textbook on human evolution, you'll find the you'll find the fact that you know that the space inside is is bigger for Neanderthals than it is for modern humans. Now, admittedly, the title of this article is you know that the brains were bigger, not necessarily better, but when this was conveyed to sort of many introductory classes over the years, it was often simply conveyed as you shouldn't stereotype the Neanderthals as dumb because look, their brains are on average bigger than ours. And so we didn't talk about as much that, you know, simply measuring brain size and measuring it in relationship to body size or measuring it in relationship to brain organization or complexity. We didn't usually talk about those things because we figured we just needed to counteract this stereotype of the stupid Neanderthal by saying, look, bigger brain, yay Neanderthals. So that at a certain point, as Sangi Lee points out, there were people in Germany wearing shirts that said, oh boy, I should have brushed up on some German pronunciations today about uh, being, uh, being, I am a Neanderthal. Page 185, some say that history advances in spirals. Germany, the site where the first Neanderthal fossil was discovered, that's that Valley of Neander, was home to one of the most racist regimes in the 20th century. Yet now, there is a movement among Germans to acknowledge and celebrate Neanderthals as their ancestors. One can see German youth wearing t-shirts that say, there it is, Ich bin ein Neanderthaler, a play on John F. Kennedy's famous quote, Huh, like I said, I am not in good German shape. Ich bin ein Berliner from a speech he gave when visiting Berlin in 1963. Does this mean that Neanderthals are being welcomed into our ancestry? I'm cautiously optimistic that the racist imagery of Neanderthals is slowly becoming a thing of the past. This racist view, like the racist colonial view of indigenous peoples, is being re-examined and hopefully disappearing. Our societies are finally embracing and celebrating their diversity. Now, yes. I feel like it was really weird. It wasn't in that chapter, it was later. It changed hands to this talk, making the same point that, you know, like this all might be in being and kind of take you and not just like so they're so to or something. And then she kept saying like how, you know, we didn't used to think indigenous Australians were human, but now we do. And we might think the same about Neanderthal. And it was just weird to me because it's like, I don't want to get caught up in either case being like, look, these people who exist today are so different from us. Like, we think they're so, you know, we used to think they're so bad. And then comparing them to an extinct, like, type of human that was like, that we already have negative stereotypes about. I thought it was just really weird because they both already had negative stereotypes about them. And she just kept comparing them. Does that make any sense? Well, I think it does because one wonders what the point is, right? It's like, what, even if all of this is true, even if there is a negative stereotype about Neanderthals and it's a, based on a racist colonial stereotype, and now we've corrected that stereotype, does that have anything to do with the contemporary racism of, of actually existing people in the present? I guess to put it bluntly, does wearing a Neanderthal shirt mean that you are going to accept Turkish immigrants into German society. And this is, has been a huge deal up to the present 
Some of you may have the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine coursing through your veins at this very moment. Uh, and that was a joint venture. The BioNTech founders are actually the children of Turkish immigrants to Germany, which, you know, I mean, there's this whole thing. I mean, that they're, they're the largest group of immigrants for a long time never had citizen, citizenship rights even for their children. That's changed in, in today's world. But, you know, was in, in many ways faced very similar kinds of, of huge, and, and today still, huge scale uh, societal discrimination. Um, even, even if they'd been in, in Germany for two or three generations as, as immigrants, and as, as, as workers and as obviously scientific contributors to their society, um, you know? And so again, even if it is true that we're welcoming Neanderthals in a non-racist way into the human family, does, does that help with any of the contemporary stuff that is going on? Um, I also, from my point of view, I don't know, I guess maybe I remember something else about the world. I always thought that there was another Neanderthal stereotype, which is that they were these kind, gentle, flower, very smart peoples who, who were eliminated because they wouldn't fight like the modern humans would and weren't so mean. And uh, was I the only one to get this, the flower Neanderthal stereotype, the hippie one? I feel like it was a subgenre. Maybe I was reading some funny comic books or something, but it, there was a, uh, I will just claim there was a competing stereotype of these sort of gentle love that they were too smart, they were too caring, they were too loving, and they were out, outrun by the, by the, the advancing uh, meaner homo sapiens. Um, so, but, you know, one of the sources of that stereotype about the, the smart Neanderthals was again this idea that they had these bigger brains. And so they were, they, that made them kinder, too nice. Now, I think that none, none of this stuff in some ways mattered that much in terms of what we thought of Neanderthals because for a long, long time, well, at first, people, when they first found Neanderthals, they were like, aha, there was our ancestors. And then people pretty quickly figured out that they weren't our direct ancestors, the Homo sapiens. And there was some debate about, well, how, how ancestral are they? And during, from about 1987, there was this incredible work, which was truly groundbreaking. And, um, and Lee describes this on page 189 and 190. It was done by uh, Rebecca Can and her team uh, doing a, a mitochondrial clock analysis. Um, and it basically was saying that all Homo sapiens could be traced back to a common African mother. This was a Newsweek cover from uh, 1989, I think. And, we could talk about the, the uh, sort of uh, strange light-skinned African stereotypes that were being proposed here. But the idea was that everything went back to uh, what they called an African Eve at about 70 to 80,000 years ago. It was this also called the out of Africa two model because you had the first, dis the first out of Africa of the Homo erectus species that we talked about, or Lee talked about a little bit. It was also called the mitochondrial Eve idea because this was all coming from the, the, the DNA of, of contemporary women and it was tracing back uh, through the maternal lineage. And it was also called the replacement model because the idea was that Homo sapiens had replaced and there was no interbreeding with any of these Neanderthals at all. And uh, at first it was a pretty radical, I mean, it was a, it was a really different way of looking at things. Um, anthropolog Paleoanthropologists in general had always been looking at fossils and to just start doing stuff with DNA like this was just 
It just blew people away. And so for a long time, for a long time, and I used this slide in intro, I'll be using it on Thursday. Um, the, from 1987, when this model came out, up until 2010, it seemed like the evidence kept accumulating for a replacement model. It just, as, and Lee talks about various people who would run the DNA and couldn't find any uh, admixture evidence with Neanderthals. They couldn't find any evidence with uh, earlier Homo erectus, those populations in Asia. Uh, people in China were running the DNA and they said there was no linkage between contemporary Chinese populations and what was called Peking man, that those didn't work. And so, you know, I mean, in anthropology textbooks, there, uh, there were anthropology textbooks that I used that just simply used this, started using this replacement model and didn't even talk about an, an older idea, which a lot of, a lot of, uh, anthropologists had uh, considered, uh, it was starting to disappear. And um, uh, there were a few people who were still holding on. And one of those people was uh, Lee's advisor, Milford Wolpoff. And uh, he was talking about, you know, he's like, well, you know, there's still fossil evidence for continuities between some of these uh, these older populations and the Homo sapiens. Um, and so, you know, what they saw was that there was a, they believed they saw fossil continuities between the features of Neanderthals and contemporary Europeans and between uh, some of the Homo erectus finds in Asia and contemporary Asians. Now, I will say that that the regional continuity model was actually a much more complicated model than the replacement model. The replacement model was easy. It was like Homo sapiens came out of Africa and they didn't interbreed with anybody and the rest of them were gone. And that's it. And it was very simple. The regional continuity model was much more difficult to understand because what they were positing was is that Homo sapiens evolved across a whole range of the Eurasian continent, and that any advantages, because they were always linked through gene flow, would then be distributed throughout the range, and so that they were evolving as a single species from about two million years ago. Now, it was misunderstood and misrepresented as that they were saying that, you know, the Asians evolved there and the Europeans, you know, they were never saying that, but, um, but it got, it got, not, it got straw manned, parodied, it, or it, it got caricatured in a way that made it seem like they were talking about separately evolving populations, and they never were. But it didn't really matter because, like I said, the replacement model was winning the field, and they were still trying to do their argument, but they were, they were losing. They were just losing. The big surprise came in 2010 when they just kept running the DNA and running it and getting more and more sophisticated. And they found that there was a one to 4% admixture of the Neanderthal DNA in contemporary humans. And so all of a sudden the Neanderthals were back in the mix, not huge back in the mix, not direct descendants, but they were somehow back in the mix. Another surprise in 2010, which Lee talks about, is the Denisovans, which we still don't have a lot of fossil evidence for the Denisovans. We have a pinky and a tooth or something. It's really small. It'd be nice to have some more somethings, something. But in terms of the genetics, we have a cousin species, the Neanderthals living over, uh, well, we first find evidence of them in the Denisova cave. And, um, so these were some big surprises. And oh, we saw Denisovan, uh, and, or Denisovan stuff showing up in contemporary human populations as well. And Lee talks about both these groups. The huge surprise, another huge surprise, is that what is basically posited is you had Homo sapiens emerging in Africa 
doing some interbreeding with Neanderthals in basically what is the Middle East. And then from there going out into Eurasia. So what you, I guess one of the things you didn't see was this idea that the, the some of the regional continuity people had that the Neanderthals and the Europeans were sort of especially linked. What you saw instead is you had this whole Eurasian admixture, which seems to be because of where the first admixture occurred. But another surprise is, although the Denisovans are up here somewhere, you really didn't see that much Denisovan DNA show up in these regions, a little bit down here in South Asia, but more in Australia and Papua New Guinea and the Philippines over in here. And so, you know, it's like they see, it's, it's the, kind of the idea that they were migrating through and then the populations that ended up in these places ended up with more Denisovan DNA than in other places. Now we're not talking about a lot here. We're still talking about, you know, a, a little bit, a, a small percentage, but it certainly was a shock and it certainly was a surprise. Now, the problem with this and the reason I, I, I bring all this up and all the stereotypes and the brains and all these things is that uh, the issue here is, or one of the, the unthought things about the way this has been described is, is that this really played into the hands of the people who wanted to see IQ differences in the human population explained by brain size and different populations mixing and not mixing together. And you would think that these people had disappeared, right? This was a big concern back in, you know, 100, 150 years ago when people were measuring skulls and trying to figure out intelligence from the size of skulls. And there's been tons and tons of disproving and debunking of that. So you'd think that they were gone, but in terms of popular stereotypes, cranial size still is like this big intelligence. It's just in, it's just in our heads. I don't know if I want to say literally. It's in our, no, I don't want to say literally. It's, it's stuck in our heads that bigger heads are smarter. It just, it, it will not be, it will not be dislodged from us as much as we, or maybe it will be someday, but it, at least in the popular idea. And the thing is, is this just, if you didn't, if you weren't thinking about it very carefully, the idea that Eurasians were mixing with these big headed Neanderthals, whereas the people in Australia and uh, the Papua New Guinea and the Philippines were the ones mixing with these small headed Denisovans, lends itself, oh, and the people in Africa were mixing maybe with some other archaic populations, like maybe a group that, uh, that, that Lee doesn't talk about very much, but the small-headed uh, uh, homo naledi populations or people like that maps on completely to some of the, the worst and most racist stereotypes that, uh, that still exist in our society today. And just recently, I found this wonderful article about that there's, they've now found out that they, there's an indigenous people in the Philippines that, have, that has the highest level of DNA from the Denisovans. And of course, what do these people look like? They occupy the Bataan Peninsula, and there they are, which are, you know, unfortunately called in, in much of the literature because of the way the Philippines were colonized. These are groups known as the Filipino Negritos. Uh, so, you know, you can see why, I guess, I hope you can see why someone like me got very nervous about 10 years ago because of all the people still circulating out there who want to make a link between uh, intelligence IQ as a heritable characteristic and talk about it in terms of different human populations. And so back in 1994, one of the most controversial books perhaps ever written, The Bell Curve, 
uh, came out, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life. And uh, Bernstein, one of the authors has passed away, but Charles Murray, you can still see him around. He, if you look for him, you can find him commenting sadly on social issues and these and things these days. He's although this book was roundly debunked and criticized, he's still around doing his Charles Murray thing. To summarize this book, you no, know, you don't have to summarize, you can just read the subtitle. The idea was: hey, intelligence is inherited, IQ is an inherited characteristic, and it structures social class, which is, you know, the exact opposite of what I would say is that social class is one thing in which, you know, people use their advantages to game the SAT scores and all those things we use to, to, to statistically call it IQ. But this was their argument. And if that's what you want to believe, then you know, you're going to start arguing against things like social programs because, you know, who cares? You're not going to change, change these inherited characteristics of people. One, most people in anthropology were extremely critical of this book, except for one, well, there were probably a few, but there was one prominent a uh, person who gave it a good review named uh, Professor Henry Harpending, who was the University of Utah, now deceased, had some correspondence with him back in the day. He's mentioned here in this book about civilization accelerating human evolution. You have to be really careful with this. I mean, I do believe that culture and biology are interlinked. And that these things are, that they play a role in each other. However, the idea of evolution often is so entwined in our ideas with progress and getting better and better that you have to be really careful with the ideas of accelerating evolution. Because basically what they start saying is that, you know, peoples with agriculture and peoples with, uh, with, with civilization are getting Look, hey, we're even getting more and more bipedal there, getting, getting smarter and smarter, basically. And so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to too dumb down the arguments of these books, but you know, there's just a whole bunch of people out there who really love playing around with, you know, DNA and keyboards and and uh, and how, what how to say uh, population racism. So when we go back to what Marx was talking about, I mean, I think he's absolutely correct in that when we, when we portrayed Neanderthals as racialized and then that, oh, well, in Africa was the emergence of modern homo sapiens and then there's Denisovans over in Asia, I'm not sure if he's talking about the same stuff I am with the kind of the, all the stereotypes that got put onto them then rejected, but then in a way get revamped up when you have this admixture stuff going on. So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is just be very careful when, you know, or not to, you know, you're going to, your anthropology majors going out into the world and somebody might ask you about Neanderthals and Denisovans and all this stuff, because it comes up a lot and you hear about it a lot in popular culture. Fortunately, or maybe I think that there's some, there's some good news here. Uh, one of the things that's perhaps good is the realization as, uh, as Lee put it, that actually when it comes to hum homo sapiens, if you, our brain size has probably been shrinking over the last 50,000 years. Now, again, we don't want to say that that necessarily means we're getting dumber. It just means that brain size is not necessarily a measure of anything. I kind of disagree with her idea, her question on page 176. If the human brain is getting smaller, the question is why? Is it that after the invention of writing and advances in computing, machines have now taken over many of the tasks 
previously performed by our brains. You know, it's the kind of smartphones make us dumber argument, right? So, in fact, I was just asked about this in Intro to Anthropology. I started talking about evolution and niche construction, and a student zoomed in to say, hey, are we going to be hunched over on our phones? Is that changing our evolution? My, my idea is, is probably not. I don't, I don't think that people are getting... <laughs> I don't think our brain size is shrinking because of machines and computers. And if so, it's not, it, it doesn't account for 50,000 years. I think that what, uh, at least from what I've read, there's an article or a chapter in this book edited by Rebecca Cassidy and Molly Mullen that was called Where the Wild Things Are Now. Don't know if your parents ever read you Where the Wild Things Are, that wonderful wonderful book, but um, it was a, a series of essays, and there was one by the anthropologist Helen Leach, who talked about the fact that, you know, when 50,000 years ago and up to about 10,000 years ago, the people who needed to survive in the harsh environments of, of the last ice ages were more robust than the humans of today. They were generally bigger, stronger. I don't know if they were faster, but they were larger. And so I feel like the reason our brain size has probably been shrinking is, has to do with the general shrinking and emphasis on what she calls the grassl, G-R-A-C-I-L-E, the, the little, the slighter bodies of today. Because we don't have to deal. Look, we're in... PowerPoint land, we're in classrooms where we get to sit in desks and we are, we don't get an evolutionary advantage from being robust most of the time. And Leech, Leech's claim is actually that the robust phenotypes, she calls the robust phenotypes of human beings, basically disappeared about 10,000 years ago. And there were so, you know, that the, having that sort of more rugged, a body built for a, a more rugged existence has, has disappeared. And she says, we better watch out because due to climate change, we're, it's gonna be, if we, if we have to survive in a more rugged environment, we're not just gonna automatically get those robust phenotypes back. It's not something you can get back by just going to the gym or running outside for a while. These are things that we've sort of lost from our lost from our phenotype or lost from our, our, our genome. And so we don't, we don't have them anymore. I also hope that the whole idea that brain size corresponds to being able to do things or intelligence or tool use, we may be starting to adjust that notion um, in part because of the finds uh, that she doesn't discuss a lot of Homo naledi uh, in, in Africa, which, uh, which John Hawks was, was involved in, and Lee Berger. Um, and oh, I should say that the, the best finds were done by, by uh, five uh, female paleoanthropologists who were the only ones who could shimmy through this cave and get into the into the uh, into the Naledi cave structure, we're finding that although they had probably small craniums, they seem to do things like bury their dead, have pretty sophisticated tool use, and have uh, pretty uh, interest. It's just a different mosaic of features, and so we're coming up to what I hope is is what. Uh, is sometimes considered a sort of second cranial revolution. So the first cranial revolution being the idea that bipedalism, not big brains, was the first thing that marked the sort of uh, split between the ape lineages and the ones that would lead to humans. So it wasn't, it wasn't the big brains, and thinking it was big brains led us into a lot of uh, potential hoaxes, as Lee mentions, the uh, the the Piltdown Man hoax, where they were able to put a put a chimpanzee uh, jaw with a human uh, a human skull and fool people for a long time, was 
was because people were looking for these big brained ancestors who really don't exist. So you had a first cranial revolution where people stopped looking for big brains and started looking for bipedalism in the record. The second one I think has to do with the, I, we're finally understanding that, you know, these bigger brains are not necessarily a prerequisite for tool use and for language and for a whole bunch of things that we thought they needed to be there for. And actually, Liz, you had a good example of that as well with the Homo floresiensis. Tell us about those people. <laughs> I don't know if people's the right word, creatures. <laughs> They're um, three feet tall and three feet. They're, they're, they resemble the hobbit in the Lord of the Rings. They're nicknamed the hobbit, yeah. Small, big feet. <laughs> After some testing, they concluded that they're more like non human primates and not relative to us. Yeah, they, I mean, they've caused a lot of controversy, but. I mean, I think that it, it seems to be the case that, you know, even with their, again, small cranial size, they seem to be hunting and using some pretty decent tools there. And so, you know, I mean, again, my hope is, the hope is that we are, uh, we're approaching a, a, a second revolution in which we will finally start to dissociate some of these ideas about simply measuring cranial capacity and equating it with ability to do a bunch of things. Um, I think maybe, maybe, maybe we're getting toward a point where we can talk about, you know, brain organization, different kinds of, you know, growing up in different environments, uh, things like that. But be careful out there. It's a wacky world. And uh, you, you, just, you just always have to watch your step when you're around a, a society that is still trafficking in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of these stereotypes. <laughs>